So let me just begin by saying uh, thank you very much to uh, UCSF and to the Catalyst Program. Thanks to Dr. Hart. And uh, thank you also to uh, Foundation Ibsen for the incredible work that has been done on diagnosing, on treating, and on highlighting the needs of uh, patients with rare diseases. I'd like to give a special thanks to um, Dr. Levine, who I've had the privilege of learning from for the last uh, three decades and uh, continue to do so each time we have the opportunity to interact. So uh, as Nate said, I have the privilege of serving as Chief Patient Officer at Biohaven. Uh, Biohaven is a commercial state pharmaceutical company that is involved in neuroinnovation. It is focused on neurological diseases and neuropsychiatric diseases. Um, I also see, have the privilege of wearing uh, a number of other hats. Uh, I'm a physician researcher, and uh, I also serve as uh, a rare advocate and serve on the board of the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases and a lot of the policy shaping work that they do. Uh, I'm also a rare parent. So I hope as we wrap up this meeting, I can give you uh, a few different perspectives from these different hats. Now, um, to begin, I would just like to offer uh, a little bit of a taking stock because we've heard lots of different perspectives throughout the day. And I'd like to bring them all together to say, where are we? Because I think that that deeply informs how we go forward. And then I'd like to offer three suggestions on the roadmap for the future and three principles that I think can help to guide us to making the most impact for rare patients and rare families in the future. So where are we today? We have heard a lot of facts and figures. We've heard a lot of different perspectives on the human toll, the public health toll, the financial toll. And when we step back from all of that, the way that I would summarize all of that is to say that today we have a public health crisis in rare diseases. If you look at the facts and figures, it is startling. And just to pick a few that uh, some have been mentioned in the day, some are available in the media and in public domain. Uh, but if you string them all together, it is quite startling. The current uh, incidents, current prevalence add up to one in 10 Americans being afflicted with rare disease. So 25 to 30 million Americans, 400 million patients worldwide being afflicted with rare diseases. And just to put that in perspective, if you look in the United States, that is more than cancer, that is more than uh, HIV put together. Okay. So rare turns out not to be so rare. And when you look at uh, the, the prevalence a little further, half of those instances are in children. And of the children, when you step back and look at some of the um, very difficult data to see, what we see is that three of 10 of children afflicted with rare diseases do not make it to their fifth birthdays. Okay. Now, beyond that, you have a situation where uh, if you look at some of the recent studies on the burden of rare diseases, you can see that the cost in the United States in a recent publication that was supported by the Every Life Foundation, the cost exceeds a trillion dollars. Okay. And 60% of that burden is borne by families when you start thinking through the direct and indirect costs of that. So uh, from all perspectives, we have a public health crisis. Now, despite all of that, uh, for more than 95% of rare diseases today, the 7,000 plus rare diseases today, we do not have a single approved FDA therapy. Okay. Staggering facts, but that is why we must come together. And that is why I think all of us are at this conference. And that is why I think we must all work together as we go forward. I'm actually very thankful to be with a community of people who are uh, eager to share their knowledge, to learn from each other, and to participate in shaping the future. So with that said, and with that context setting, 
let me move to the roadmap for the future. Um, we've heard some terrific specifics in the course of the day. Uh, I've been taking a lot of notes, uh, a lot of learning from uh, esteemed, very distinguished speakers. Um, but I'd like to focus on three things that I think are uh, not specific to any particular rare disease, but are overarching principles that will be helpful as we navigate the, the, uh, the next few years across all rare diseases. Let me begin with the first pillar, which relates to continuing to open doors to research. Now, this is something which, as a drug developer, when you look at rare diseases can initially be very daunting because of the limited patient numbers, because of the typical statistical and operational challenges that we encounter in clinical trials. It can be um, quite challenging to think through how to study rare diseases, but there's been a lot of work on the science of small trials, um, there's been a, a lot of uh, effort put into how can we open the doors. And I'd like to highlight a few best practices that I've seen that I think could be very impactful, again, going across the wide range of rare diseases. The first thing is to be uh, very deliberate about uh, identifying patients. And we heard some uh, great efforts today. Uh, we've uh, heard some comments on newborn screening. We've heard a lot of good feedback on that. But I think that has to be a very deliberate process in reaching out to patients, engaging them very often in partnership with uh, patient advocacy groups to alert them and engage them in the clinical trials process. The second is also to think very deliberately about enrollment criteria. Um, this is an area where it's very easy to be uh, conservative. It's very easy to be um, uh, quite restrictive inadvertently, but uh, it's also an area where if we're thoughtful, we can make some uh, specific, quite deliberate changes that open the doors to much wider groups of patients. A third um, area in terms of opening the doors relates to uh, taking advantage of decentralized trials. And this is, a, this is something which uh, has become very current in recent months because of the pandemic. Uh, as some of you have seen, many of the trials that were conducted during the pandemic were forced to use decentralized and virtual technologies and many different stages of trial conduct. And in fact, that has turned out to be a very positive trend. Um, the pandemic has brought us to a place where I was looking uh, recently at some of the uh, feedback on some of the some, some of the analysis sorry on um, trials planned for 2022 uh, global data had published and there are 1300 trials that are planned for 2022 that are using decentralized or virtual technologies in order to increase trial reach and to affect trial conduct now to put that in perspective that's about uh, 28 percent more than the number of trials that were using decentralized technologies just a year ago. And I hope that that isn't a transient blip during the pandemic, but that's something that can be enduring and that we can use to take forward. A fourth area that I think has been uh, very uh, practical and been very impactful can on the surface seem small, but turns out to be large in real life is the use of patient concierge services and using concierge services, which make trials that are often uh, difficult to access, difficult to reach, uh, not all steps of the trial can be undertaken virtually, but makes these trials accessible and reachable. And to give you an example, you know, we were looking at some of uh, Biohaven's work recently in our spinal cerebral ataxia trials and looked at the phase two, phase three studies and took a very simple step of rather than having patients come into trial centers for um, uh, the, the taking of specimens and samples, we put in place a team of mobile phlebotomists, uh, the nurses that could go out and uh, take samples at the patient's home. Now that may seem a very small step, but in real life, um, that can be the difference between being able to participate practically or not the hours drive, the mobility, the reaching uh, a clinical trial site safely. 
taking all of those things off the table and actually making something uh, reachable for patients. And I hope that that's just one example. There are many, many hundreds of others, but I hope that's something that we as trialists can be very deliberate about as we go forward. Finally, um, the, the other thing that I think has been quite illuminating about the last several months has been with respect to um, how decentralized trials impact minority populations. And I'd just like to read you all um, a quotation from, um, from uh, the president of the Black Women's Health Imperative, which is Linda Gola Blount. She says, African-Americans and Latinos die disproportionately from rare diseases. Blacks have higher death rates than whites for 12 of the 15 leading causes of death in the United States and almost all rare diseases. This is important in the context of decentralized trials because some of the publications just in the last two to three months have been prominent publications in JAMA, in the New England Journal of Medicine, about the impact of decentralized trials and specifically how decentralized trials have increased the accessibility of trial participation to minority populations. So um, we have some great possibilities there. And that's just a, a very quick summary, but I hope that gives uh, some examples of the steps that we can take to open the doors to more patients to participate in the research process. That's the first point. The second pillar that uh, I would like to suggest relates to standing up together. Now, to change the status quo, uh, we live in a complex environment and it's very clear that uh, we will have to come together as disparate, sometimes competing stakeholders in some forums. But to give an example of that, um, if you look at you know, one, some of the stakeholders that we've had today, uh, I really have to you know, uh, applaud the Catalyst program for bringing together such a, a diverse group of different voices. We often see the FDA having you know, very thoughtful perspectives on patient-focused drug development and others drawing many others in. It was the same for the NIH. It's wonderful to see that. Uh, thank you to Dr. Irv at the beginning. And uh, we've seen patient groups, you know, a third group, a lot of large industry and small industry, many of the academic and research groups, scientific and academic societies, and also philanthropic groups. And that's probably not a complete list, but you have there a lot of stakeholders that need to come together. And I think that we need to be very deliberate about finding forums and always asking ourselves, you know, um, could I do this more quickly? Could I do this more effectively? You know, could we make a greater impact if we were able to come together and collaborate? Um, it's almost like a twist on the age-old proverb about uh, going fast alone versus going far together. I think for rare diseases, we need fast and far. And uh, I think together increases the chances of that actually for rare diseases. I wanna just leave you with one example of that that I think has been a very positive light and I'd really like to encourage as a pillar for the future. That example relates to master protocols. You know, if you look in oncology, uh, master protocols have been in place for over a decade with some of the early iSPY trials being um, initiated in uh, 2010. For rare diseases, that has come much later. And just, for, uh, just to explain in simple terms, in case anyone is not familiar, we typically conduct clinical trials in a linear, longitudinal fashion. What master protocols do is try to bring together multiple agents typically into one protocol. So it can often involve many sponsors and master protocols take various different forms. You can have uh, platform trials or uh, umbrella trials, basket trials, but they try to bring together typically multiple uh, investigational agents and sometimes multiple indications. The impact of master trials though can be very significant. Uh, some of the data reading out from the oncology master protocols that have been deployed over recent years have shown that 
um, there can be quite a significant reduction in cost, 12 to 15 percent, uh, reductions in timeline, 15 to 18 percent, and then um, reductions in risk, uh, which affect the ability to invest in protocols too. So that, that's a very simplified version, but if you look at some of the results, uh, it is intriguing, and I think it presents great potential. In rare disease, we've started to see master protocols being deployed more. Uh, some of the early, um, early protocols just in the last couple of years, one of, I mean, in, in my own case, one of um, Biohaven's protocols for uh, Veridiperstat, which is an ALS investigational agent, was introduced into a master protocol that was being led by uh, the Healy and AMG Center at Massachusetts General Hospital. It kicked off last year. And um, I think, you know, it takes courage to participate in a master protocol, but it is very often the best way to meet patients' needs. So um, that's something that I think holds a lot of potential for the future. Final pillar. Um, the final pillar, I think, uh, is something that relates to being very deliberate about uh, building transparency and trust. And to comment on this, I'd like to step back a little bit from rare diseases and say that you know, many of the people uh, at this summit, uh, many of the people who are participating in rare diseases are scientists. Okay? We've talked about the multiple stakeholders. But uh, one of the, the macro trends that we've seen in society in the last several months has related to trust in science. And despite the vaccine, despite, you know, hopefully it's all pulling out of the pandemic, unfortunately a decline in the trust in science. And um, for those of you who track these things, some of the uh, Pew Trust, for example, readings from the last few months in February, of this year, the trust of the public in medical scientists to do what is right for the public. Okay? The trust was at a level of 29%. Okay? Now, that sounds low, but if you put that in the context of where it was last November, it was at 40%. Because not only that it is unacceptably low, but that it has fallen even in recent months as vaccines and the pandemic have made such a positive impact in society. And I raise that because for the rare disease population in particular, um, I think we have to see the connection between public trust and public policy. And public policy has a very disproportionate effect on rare diseases because of the numerous steps of the, the um, process that we have all talked about today, the starting with newborn screening and public policies in that arena, uh, also relating to accelerated approval and the policy in that area, also related to access, reimbursement and the policy in that area. So across the spectrum, the importance of public trust is extremely high. And I raise that because there are many steps that all of us in the rare disease process can take. Um, depending on which hat one wears, it could relate to you know, trial integrity or publications or uh, independent scientific decision making or uh, transparency in communicating you know, information to the public, uh, whatever it may be. But I think all of us have to step back and say that we have a responsibility not only in the particular rare disease that we are working in, and not only in the rare disease community at large, but also in the science community at large. And that responsibility is one where we, you know, we have made tremendous advancements in science, some advancements in uh, social values, but the moral values and the ethical perspective, that is something that I think in the rare community, we have to stand up and take leadership on. So um, I'm gonna say uh, thank you very much for the chance to share some reflections uh, after so many distinguished speakers. Um, those three pillars are valuable as we pave the roadmap for the future. And I just end up with words that, you know, the possibilities of science are boundless. And we've seen that through some incredible examples today. 
uh, we I'm sure we'll continue seeing that. But the roadmap only works if we keep patients absolutely at the center of everything that we do. And I think all of us are the uh, dreams. Uh, but you know, the future is shaped not only by the dreamers, but uh, by the people with the courage to act. So uh, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to uh, share some reflections. And uh, I look forward very much to collaborating and acting together. Thank you.